everyone, this is Alex at BP Auto Sports, and today will be the first installment of the Super Build video. Now, as many of you know, I've been building this 94 Toyota Supra for the past few years, and it's gone through a number of different changes and setups and always trying something new and different with it. And this setup behind me here is arguably the craziest that the car has ever been. Throughout this build series, I'll be covering different parts and components and systems and everything that has to work together to make a car like this function and go down the track. Now with this car being used as a shop mule and an experiment, many of the things that we'll go over are not tested, they're not tried and true, and it's things that I'm experimenting with to see how well they work. This shouldn't be used as a build recipe or a step-by-step -step on how to put a car like this together but it may provide new ideas for your builds, explanations of new tools that you may want to learn how to use, and above all, a learning experience for all of us. So without further ado, let's dive right into this. talk a little bit about the construction of this header because it's a little bit different than what you typically see with a 2JZ application. Rather than placing the turbo by the head like you typically see with a 2JZ manifold, I opted to place it more outboard down off of the tube nose to really showcase the header and to make much more of it visible as opposed to being hidden by the turbo like you typically see with one of these, one of these manifolds. The primaries are stepped. They go from inch and seven eighths off of the head flange to two inch before they go into the primary merge collectors. Exiting the primary merge collectors, we have flex bellows to help with expansion and contraction of the header and to prevent it from cracking or rupturing due to the metal moving. Out of those, we have two and a half inch secondaries going into the secondary collector and then exiting into a three and a half inch tube that goes down to the turbine flange. All of the merge collectors used in this header are dual slip design which is a redundant sealing system that has one tube sliding into another and then a cup welded over top of the tube that slips over the top of the collector, making it so there's two hard 180 degree bends for exhaust gas to have to make to leak. It makes it virtually impossible. Headers also flanged for twin TurboSmart ProGate 50 millimeter wastegates. This will hold the ProGate 50, the ProGate 50 Lite, or their new ProGate 50 millimeter compressed gas waste case. I've had great luck with TurboSmart products in the past on all my other different setups, so of course I ended up putting them on this as well. And then last but not least, on the bottom side of each one of the primaries is a bung for an individual EGT sensor. And this will allow us to more effectively tune individual cylinders as far as their fuel ratios, temperatures in each, to make sure the engine's running at its peak performance as much as it possibly can be. Now the theory behind the function of this exhaust manifold is trying to increase the mass flow that we see through the header going to the turbine. Mass flow, as I'm referring to it, is the amount of exhaust gas traveling through the header, entering the turbine housing, and therefore causing the turbo to spin, to make boost, to make more power. The primaries will provide the initial exhaust charge and the, the initial exhaust volume that will then enter the secondaries. Exiting the primaries, going into the secondaries, will be a larger charge of exhaust gas still traveling at velocity. And entering the final tube that enters the turbine flange will be hopefully a condensed form of exhaust gas that will enter the turbine will cause it to spin and will provide a header that produces power without too much lag, but of course nitrous can solve any lag problems that we do have with this. Now obviously this is an experimental header design. Um, I haven't seen really anything like it before and it may work, it may not work, but the only way to really tell and the only way to really find out is to put it into practice and see if it does function as I think it will. If it doesn't work according to plan, then I have a really nice mantelpiece or a really nice paperweight and a really expensive paperweight at that. Let's talk a little bit about material options for building a manifold or a header. On the left, 
we have Schedule 10, inch and a half, 304 stainless. In the center, we have inch and a half, Schedule 5, 321 stainless. And on the right, we have two inch, 49,000th wall, ink and L625 tubing. All three of these different materials were ones that I considered for building the header out of. Now we can see the three different wall thicknesses on the different materials here. This is inch and a half schedule 10 304 stainless at roughly 109,000th wall. This is inch and a half schedule 5 321 stainless at approximately 83,000th wall. And then this is two inch 49,000th wall 625 ink now. Obviously, as wall thickness increases, so does the weight of the material being used and therefore the weight of the end product. Now with weight being such a huge consideration on this project, as it is a drag car and we are trying to keep weight down as much as possible, that was the main reason why I wanted to go with ink and L tubing as opposed to either one of the schedule pipe options. Now 304 stainless is what you'll see most manifolds made out of. It's cheap, it's inexpensive, but it lacks the thermal fatigue resistance that superior alloys do possess. 321 stainless is a superior alloy when compared to 304 stainless. It's a stabilized alloy of stainless with titanium added to its alloy structure to prevent carbide precipitation. Carbide precipitation is a combination of carbon and chromium under high heat situations such as welding that when combined reduce the corrosion resistance of the material. 321 stainless has a higher nickel content than 304 stainless as well, which the more nickel in a material, the more resistant it is to thermal fatigue and failures due to high heat situations. However, even with the added benefits of this alloy, I'd still have to maintain at least a 65,000th wall thickness, which was still thicker than I wanted to go with to try to keep weight down with this particular part. Which leads us to Ink and L625. It is hands down the paramount material to use for header construction. It's also used in heavy industry, in aerospace, in the upper echelons of motorsport, in any situation where high heat or extreme corrosion resistance is a necessity. Ink and L625 is a high nickel alloy with at least 60% nickel in its alloy structure, as well as molybdenum and chromium for added strength. It's difficult to work with, it's difficult to obtain, and very expensive, but for anybody looking to compete at the highest level in motorsports and have the lightest parts they possibly can, it's simply a no-brainer. Now since I have pieces cut out of 304 stainless, 321 stainless, and Ink and L625, why don't I do a weld for you guys so you can see the aesthetic difference between each and then we'll weigh the pieces afterwards so we can see the actual weight difference between them. Now each stub here is approximately 4 inches in length, giving us 8 inches overall length for each piece. Now this should give us a pretty good idea of both weight and aesthetics for each one of the given materials, and maybe give you an idea of which one you'd like to use for your project. For this test, I'm going to be using my SPW-14 gas nozzle on my CS310 TIG torch. I'll be setting the amperage at an appropriate level for each material thickness, keeping gas flow constant at 30 to 35 CFH and properly back purging each one of the weld joints. Now we have tacked together 304 stainless, 321 stainless, and Ink and L625. And I'll be back purging with my TIG Aesthetic Silicone Back Purge Plug Kit. Comes in extraordinarily handy for all different sizes of pipe and tubing. Uh, I highly recommend getting a set of them.
before stainless, you can see the beads a little bit wider. I had to use a little bit more heat on this one to get through the wall thickness to get full penetration. Next, we have 321 stainless. The weld is about the same width as that of the 304 stainless weld. However, the coloration of the weld and the amount of heat used to produce this weld are much different than 304 stainless. Now, the reason that I use less heat on the 321 stainless pipe as opposed to the 304 stainless pipe is because of the thinner wall thickness of 321 stainless. Now, with a thinner piece of metal that you're welding, the less heat you will have to use or the less amperage to get through the pipe to the inside of it to create a full penetration weld. And last but not least, we have the Ankenel 625 weld piece. Now this piece, being even thinner than that of 321 stainless, took a substantially lower amount of heat to achieve a proper full penetration weld. And you can see in the aesthetics of this weld that the weld itself is very gold with a little bit of blue around it, which is just a product of the alloy's properties. Now as stated before, each one of these welds, or each one of these pieces, is approximately the same length, I use approximately the same welding techniques with each one of them, and every single one of them is full penetration, was back purged, was done properly, they're done in a way that I would put into a header or a manifold as a normal production piece. However, they are all extremely different from one another from a weight standpoint, from a welding dynamic standpoint, an aesthetic standpoint, material standpoint, from virtually any standpoint that you could possibly imagine. And the most important part is always the bottom line when you're putting something like this together. From right to left, 304 stainless, 321 stainless, and 625 Inconel, respectively, it goes in order of cost from least to most expensive. 321 stainless, as opposed to 304 stainless, is typically a few hundred dollars additional cost in materials cost for a given project. However, Inconel 625, as opposed to even 321 stainless, is much, much more expensive. Inconel's cost is more than double that of 321 stainless pipe. And being as such, Inconel is cost prohibitive for the average enthusiast. I wouldn't recommend Inconel 625 for the average enthusiast or the average do-it-yourselfer. Either of the schedule pipe options will provide more than adequate strength, ability to work with, and availability for the average do-it-yourselfer or average automotive enthusiast that is looking for a turbo manifold or a header for your vehicle. However, if you are looking to compete at the highest level and build a header that is as light as it can possibly be without sacrifices in strength or longevity, Inconel is the best option. But bear in mind that for these exotic properties, you will pay exotic prices for them. stainless, 321 stainless, and 625 Inconel here at the scale to weigh them. Now you can see there's nothing on the scale. It is zeroed out. You can see as I press down on it, the scale does go up in weight. And you can see the different wall thicknesses to signify the respective alloys. Now first we'll take the 304 stainless piece and place it on the scale. You can see with this piece on the scale, it reads approximately one pound, five ounces. Now removing this from the scale, and the scale being back to being zero, let's now take the 321 stainless piece and place it on the scale. Now with 321 stainless on the scale, we see the weight has dropped a little bit, from one pound, five ounces to one pound even. And now replacing 321 stainless with Inconel 625, Let's see what the weight is on this piece. And with 625 Inconel on the scale, we can see the weight has dropped from one pound five ounces all the way down to 11 ounces for an eight inch long section. So why don't we weigh the header itself and see how much it truly does weigh. I'm going to use this box here as a place for the header to sit on because it won't 
properly sit on the scale by itself. Now we see the box has a weight of approximately two pounds, five ounces. So we'll press this button and zero it out. So now we'll take the header and with the scale still zeroed out, we'll set it on there and see what it weighs. Now with the header on here, fully assembled aside from waste gates, we can see a weight of 22 pounds, 15 ounces. Now this may seem like a minute difference in weight to some of you, but if you consider the amount of surface area or the amount of material used in a header, it's pretty substantial. Now the old adage with race cars is ounces make pounds, and the more pounds you take off your car, in theory, the faster you will go. Now this should be pretty clear why I chose to use ink and L as opposed to 304 stainless or 321 stainless schedule piping. You can do the math and figure out by surface area how much weight difference there would be between this header and one built out of either one of the schedule pipe options. However, with our simple experiment of the eight inch long sections of the three different materials, you can see the substantial difference in weight between each one of the options. And this project also gave me the opportunity to experiment with a new alloy, a new material, and to figure out processes and ways to work with it that I hadn't had a chance to do before. In factoring all these criteria in and figuring out a way to come up with the money for it, it was a no-brainer to use Inc. and L625 for this particular project. And the way to figure that out, as with most things, is through practice, through trials and tribulations and experimentation. So we will see how well this thing functions, how well it works, if it explodes, if it works well, makes power, loses power, who knows. But for now, there's a ton left to do on that thing, and we'll cover more of it in the next episode. Now I have to thank a few people for getting me the materials to put this thing together. In no particular order, we have the guys at Royal Innovations for the beautiful CNC head flange. We have Turbo Smart and Precision Turbo for getting me the wastegate flanges and the turbine flange, respectively. We have Michael Furick at Dogfab for getting me the Ink and L tubing, the merge collectors, and the flex bellows. And we have everybody at Pro Fabrication and Race Pack for getting me the spring and tab assemblies and the EGT bungs, respectively. Now, all these guys are going to be linked in the description below, so if you need materials or flanges or anything else for your projects you can find them down there and make sure to get a hold of them for anything that you may need so if you like what you saw in this video and you want to see more of this particular project or learn more about different tools different processes or anything else make sure to like subscribe leave a comment below and we'll see you guys next time thanks for watching